Okay, I do think we are ready to get started. I still have 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, well with that, hello everyone and welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. Thank you for joining us for the final conversation of research and conversation in the Faculty of Arts and Science for the winter semester of 2023. To help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Fourth Space, which is located on unceded Indigenous lands in Chajage, Montreal. At Fourth Space, we work with our university community to mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities to examine research questions and projects in development here at the university. We are running this event as a live streamed meeting, so we welcome your comments and questions with a raised hand or via the chat if you're joining by Zoom. For those of you in the space, if you'd like to participate, just let us know by raising a hand and we'll get a microphone to you. It is now my pleasure to hand it over to Associate Dean of Research, Patrick Theroux. Thank you. And <laughs> um, thanks, Dave. Uh, feedback. Um, thank you uh, to the core space. <laughs> Sorry about the feedback. I, I was uh, radiating. Uh, Charisma, I think. Um, th thanks to the four space for for hosting us uh, yet again. Uh, thank you also to the Dean of Arts and Science for for allowing me to do this. Now, normally I'd be sitting at my desk or uh, evaluating research chairs or, or walking through various research centers and having sometimes difficult conversations. But instead, I'm here with colleagues having extraordinary uh, conversations about ongoing research and what animates them. What fuels them. Um, just a reminder that uh, we've had 18 conversations with 26 researchers in the Faculty of Arts and Science so far. So considering that there's about 500 uh, colleagues, full-time colleagues, I just have 474 conversations to go. So we're, 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 we're I think, uh, 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 part way there. Um, today we'll be discussing about um, an essential topic uh, and a sort of oblique one, um, and you'll, you'll see where I'm getting with this, uh, we're looking at science, but through the eyes of humanities and social sciences. So we want to shake things up and rather than sort of focus on, on individual specializations, we want to have a larger conversation. And it's really a pleasure uh, to, to have with us uh, Matthew Barker, uh, an associate professor in philosophy, welcome. Uh, Francesca Scala, a professor in political science and a colleague in the Dean's office. She's the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies. Welcome. Happy to be here. And David Secco, a professor in journalism. And interestingly, uh, I, I've had meetings with you in your various uh, uh, capacities as, as chairs, department chairs and administrators. So it's really, really great to, uh, to forget about administration and to dive into uh, whatever fuels us. Um, so very briefly, uh, I, I could, you know, I've got pages and pages uh, to, to describe each and every one of you, but very briefly, so Matthew Barker, um, much of your research uh, uncovers and answers philosophical questions about scientific categories. Um, and some of the questions that focus uh, you, you focus on uh, really look at specific categories such as species and individual in biology, well-being and humility in psychology, and element in, in chemistry, to name but those through uh, three aspects. Um, interestingly, you have a BSc in biology, so you have the, you have that scientific uh, foundation, and then moved on to philosophy for, for BA and. Uh, MA and a, and a PhD in philosophy. And you've been at Concordia um, basically since 2011 and uh, now associate professor. I'll continue the, the introductions and then we'll dive into the questions. Uh, if you'll allow me, Francesca. Um, so you, you're interested, your research is basically focused on um, uh, reproductive politics, uh, gender and public policy. Um, your, your research explores issues related to policy deliberations in the life sciences and the role of experts and citizens in policy making. Um, one, of, one of the questions you, you ask, I think this was on your explore page, how do we create a space to engage with the public? And this is certainly one of these spaces and, and I'll be happy to, uh, to expand that space. Uh, David, um, 
both a scientist and a journalist, uh, an energetic advocate uh, for engaged applied journalism. Um, as, as with Matt, you, you have a science background. Um, so you, you did your BSc in microbiology and immunology, and then a PhD in the same topic at, uh, at UBC. Then you moved on to, uh, to journalism. You did your master's in journalism. Uh, at, at UBC and eventually a, a postdoc at the Center for Applied Ethics. So combining aspects of journalism and obviously your, your degrees in uh, microbiology and immunology. And you've been at Concordia since 2007 in, in uh, I know, time flies. <laughs> That's, <a long> time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what your CV that. says. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you fudge the dates. But, uh, <laughs> but you, you've been here a while, um, almost as long as I have, uh, 2000. I think. Um, and you, you've been d diving into um, th this, this, this juxtaposition, the, the, this meeting of uh, science and, and journalism and creating a number of uh, uh, extraordinary, um, uh, not extracurricular, but curricular uh, uh, possibilities. So this Summer Institute, uh, for instance, that we'll talk about in, in a moment. In each of your uh, experiences, um, get a sense that you're um, basically looking at how do we engage meaningfully uh, with, with, with science from your perspective. Um, let, 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 me, let me ask, I guess, a sort of oblique question. Given that you have a relationship with science, but that you are positioned in the humanities and social science departments, do you see yourself as an outsider looking in or, or, or not? And how, how do you see yourselves looking into and at and engaging with science? Well, that's thinking that's not yeah, the question you said you'd ask. <laughs> well, I can say I have no background in the sciences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so I think I would, I would identify as an outsider, as somebody who's looking at the scientific community, at the pursuit of science, scientific projects and really looking at the scientific enterprise from a sociological or policy or political perspective. Uh, so I, I can engage with conversations with scientists in terms of what they're doing, what is their mission, what are some of the new developments, but my interest really lies in, so what are the social, ethical, political implications of mm -hmm. some of these uh, emerging issues or developments, which at face value look very interesting, look like they could be very beneficial, uh, but there's always, you know, issues or challenges or disputes that are going to emerge from some of these developments. So this is how, this is how I approach the study of science. Um, so definitely, I am not part of that community. <laughs> uh, I am sometimes invited to, to participate in conversations or, or present from a sociological or social scientific research or some of the issues that are emerging in assisted human reproduction. Uh, but I certainly, you know, see myself as not as a member, but as as a participant, as uh, as somebody who can engage in those conversations. Hopefully, yeah. Thank you. Hey, I mean, um, I love this question because it's really interesting um, in terms of inside, outside, and all mm -hmm. the elements. So of course, there's like they're not going to allow me to to operate on somebody. You know what I mean? Do open heart surgery as much as me and Matt want to. You know what I mean? To see what would it be like? Did the person survive? Patrick, I'm looking. If you ever need help, you know, you call us. But at the same time, like, I also um, don't want to just stand outside and watch what's happening, right? So I'm really interested or have tried to blur that boundary to the point that it doesn't exist in the sense of that it doesn't matter if I have this background or that background. I have an interest, I have an intelligence. And, and I have a, like a, a passion to want to talk about these things and figure out ways that we can all be part of it in that kind of a sense. But I would be eyes closed to think that there wasn't views about one way or the other. And um, the, the interesting kind of where my mind goes to this is there was a point in my career where I had too much scientific knowledge to be a journalist um, and too much journalism knowledge to be a scientist. So I was like stuck with, with like nothing. And that's kind of just kind of a fun in games. But there were times where I went to jobs um, let's say when I was trying to transition into journalism and, you know, I was a journalist for a while, science journalist, and I loved it, where they, they would, it would be clear to me, I'm not saying somebody said it outright, that, that they're like, ah, you know, you might be too embedded in that world to be critical enough of it to really say, oh, these people are doing things that might not be right for X, Y, and Z, or might not be in all of our best interest. 
Well, at the same time, if I wanted to go back into the lab, it might be, oh, well, you haven't published a lot. You haven't done this much research in microbiology. Well, what have you grown lately? What have, what right. have you done um, in that kind of a sense? So, you know, but I wasn't trying to kind of be one or the other. I was trying to be a mixture of the two, right? And that's where, for me, it got exciting. Oh, and so you were growing critical discourse uh, ra rather yeah, than fungus. A, a little bit, you know what I mean? At the <laughs> times, I wouldn't have put those terms to it, but I think about it now that... Like at this stage, I really, I love the humanities. It's given me so much and I love the scientific training I got as well. Um, so like, I wouldn't necessarily put my foot in either if, if I like, like had the choice, but I do see myself now as a journalism studies scholar, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm in that world. That's where I'm, I'm kind of bringing my ideas from and now trying to think about what scientists and science can do to help include groups that typically had no part in their discussions for a long time. Just a quick follow-up question. Yeah. So, sorry, man. I'm just, uh, I'm just curious about uh, uh, understanding also. Uh, so your, your object is study for, for the most part is, is the sciences through journalism. But I'm curious to know how did uh, the sciences affect your approach to journalism? Yeah. So that um, two ways, I guess. One is that like it was very clear to me early on that that's what I liked. That's what I wanted to study and talk about and do. And um, I wanted to know enough of it that I felt like I could have a conversation with virtually anybody about a topic I might be interested in. Mm -hmm. But it also kind of positioned me, and this is where it's a great to, to, for Matt to jump in, that I don't know that I would have thought about how to solve a problem in exactly that way until I had had some experience really thinking through like the very like, okay, what data do we have? What do we have to actually support this idea where it is? Right. Versus when I got started to study in journalism, I felt a lot freer to just, hey, I have ideas, you know what I mean? I don't need anything to back this up yet um, in that way. I just want to talk about things that kind of get there. Mm -hmm. So I think the impact it had on me was really a view of how we get to know the world and, and how we know what we know um, that I've kind of taken with me through time. But that would probably be no different from where, like, you might describe it in exactly the same way in terms of your background, Patrick, in that sense. So I often find that as I talk more and more, these things tend to bleed into each other right. really closely. And it's on the scientific debates where we start to see, and probably we're going to talk a little bit about that at mm -hmm. some point, yep. we start to see some, some um, clarification of positioning and worldview and how we might want to do things. Right. Yeah, thanks. Matt, so the, this question of positionality and, and outsider, insider, how, how do you read this? How do you view this? Yeah, so I think initially you put it, by asking, do you sometimes feel like an outsider, right? Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, if, this, if you need a short answer, yeah, sometimes you do, but it often depends on, you know, your frame and your perspective. And I like to think of academia and, and research and knowledge creation as it's a, it's a huge partnership, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so when you take that broader view, everybody's on the inside in some way and you're interacting with each other. And there are some contexts you get into when you're in that partnership where you need to defer a bit to somebody else who has expertise that you don't. Um, and other times where you see a place where you can add something, right? But it's all, it's a constant interaction and changing perspectives, you know, different brains of focus. Um, but yeah, I mean, e even within my own discipline, I think probably everybody sometimes feels like an outsider within their own discipline, right? So. Right. I do, you know, philosophy of biology is one of my areas of expertise, but that's kind of on the margins of philosophy. And so a lot of other philosophers think, well, you're doing philosophy of something else. Mm. Um, and so then I feel like, well, I have to communicate with philosophers now too, right? That, that's extra work. And uh, so it, it just all depends what the problem is, who you're interacting with. Uh, right. And, and who, who are you interacting with? <laughs> it seems like there's multiple audiences, multiple interlocutors. Yeah, so, you know, when I started out uh, and realized, you know, I'm joining a profession and there mm -hmm. are peers that I have and I need to go to conferences and, and present to them, I, I suppose those were the main interlocutors. Uh, but then you realize you, you have to try and make your work relevant to people outside of that narrow community, and then it expands, right? And mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're fortunate, you get some opportunities to do that. Uh, so now, you know, in addition to talking to just philosophers of biology, I jump at the chance to work with people in a broader space, um, you know, work with scientists, work with, with others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where, where do uh, scientists and, and science bring you uh, in your object of, of study and perhaps concern? Uh, in other words, what are some of the topics uh, in, in the sciences today that are of particular interest to you? 
and I'm opening this up uh, to all three of you. I'm thinking off the top of my head of AI, for instance, and in our role uh, in the humanities and social sciences uh, that, that I think can be instrumental in, in helping uh, uh, fundamentally think about and, and, and orient some of this, uh, the, the, this research. I'm thinking about bioethics, um, you know, as we're creating, what is it, 16,000 uh, permutations in the genomic uh, foundry per second. I can't remember the exact numbers. Uh, and I'm just thinking, wow, we are creating life. And, and so I'm just curious, so um, what is our place in that, in, in that discourse, in that dialogue? Are we heard? What can we contribute? I guess I'll start with Matt. And... Yeah, sure. So what can we as people in the humanities and social yeah. sciences contribute yeah. to those? Um, I think a lot. I mean, it depends on finding people you can work with and, uh, you know, make progress with. So one example of my own, recently, I was really fortunate to work with a biologist on a paper together. Mm -hmm. um, and it was in an area that I have, you know, interests going back a long time. So when I was growing up, I loved the outdoors and I loved wilderness. And so I was always interested in conservation. Um, and, I, and I had some jobs in that area. And then, you know, I found somebody here on campus who works in that area in biology. Mm -hmm. And we realized, oh, we have some shared interests in what roles values play in conservation. Right. And how can we best integrate considerations of value into arguments that scientists make in mm -hmm. their re published research. Um, and so we, we worked on a project together and we looked at the kinds of arguments that were appearing in, in the literature and Okay, how could how could we get the empirical side to to work better with the value side on this, or vice versa? Right. So. And that, and I guess the uh, the framing of this research and eventually the publication uh, probably had to do with um, uh, sure it's interdisciplinary approach, but where do you publish this? Right? Do you yeah. publish this in a philosophy journal? Do you publish this in a interdisciplinary you know, approaches journal? Because it'll def it'll definitely affect methodology. It'll affect your literature review it will affect the length of the article as well yeah it affects a lot of things so in this case it was a science journal okay. per se, right as biological conservation um and but you know i'm fortunate that conservation is well aware that it has many aspects that are not purely scientific to it right, right. and so there's um it, there's a lot of room okay. to to go in there and work with scientists um yeah and other times though it doesn't work out so well. So I think I've mentioned to you before, you know, there's another paper I published a long time ago that was really quite biological, mm. but I published it in a philosophy journal uh, with a co-author and it just didn't get as much attention, right? Right. Um, so you didn't get the audience quite right in that case. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Francesca, you, you've been, uh, I won't go the AI route or the uh, bioethics route, mm -hmm. um, because I know that's not necessarily in your wheelhouse, but, but you have done, uh, essential research on, on reproduction, re reproductive uh, uh, technologies and, and, and the ethics uh, and social implications. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you navigate that? And, and how are you uh, engaging with, with, with the scientists, with, with, the, with, with, their, uh, with their results, but also do you, do you actually uh, enter into a dialogue with them? Um, yes and no. So I think a lot of, you know, so I think what's happened in the past 20 years is, is, is there's a greater recognition on the part of government and the public and even the scientific community that we have to create spaces for citizens to come in, different stakeholders to come in, mm -hmm. to have a voice, you know, on, uh, on policies, on government policies. So from my perspective, it's really about, you know, what is being done, you know, across countries, you know, they're facing similar challenges with AI, they're feeling, you know, same challenges with, um, assisted human reproduction or stem cell research. Uh, so for me, the interest is like, what is the role of science, scientific advisors? Uh, what kind of policies are being put in place? What kind of processes are being put in place to make sure that citizens have an avenue to participate in those kinds of deliberations. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily necessarily on the content. I have I have several colleagues who are very much engaged and and involved um, on issues uh, related to that and publish in, um, you know, in medical journals, right, to sort of influence policy. But from my perspective, it's really about the process. It's mm -hmm. really about, you know, the power dynamics. It's trying to make sure that those voices have a place 
in those kinds of discussions because you know 20 30 40 years ago they were they were marginalized and the scientific community you know made decisions and developed new technology and scientific advancements away from public scrutiny okay. uh, not that there's anything nefarious but that's that's how it was and then we got dolly the sheep you know in the late 1990s I and everything's like saying what is going on here um, and so that sort of put you know those broader issues of what is the role of the public what is the role of government how do we how do we make sure that again we have those venues where we can have those discussions and have you know and decide and, and try to resolve not that they're resolved but try to resolve right. those kinds of disputes and, and controversies right and, and these disputes would be between uh, i guess a pure scientific inquiry that brings us uh, maybe perhaps iffy iffy uh, uh, ethical zones um mm -hmm. and uh uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have yes, the, the tolerance of, of the general public for, uh, for for this sort of research. But so, what is what is your place in there? Who are you addressing? Are you addressing government? Are you addressing the scientists? It sounds like it can go by both ways, right? Well, I'm addressing I'm addressing public policy scholars, and right. and uh, so so my research is very much geared towards that body of of, of knowledge and scholarship. Uh, but as well, it's really practitioners, government. Um, policymakers, right, in that field. So if, if my research can make a contribution, not necessarily, again, I'm not, I don't have expertise in the science of it, but I do have some knowledge and I've conducted research on the processes, right, mm -hmm. and the challenges and potential pitfalls, the legitimacy of some of these developments or policies when you don't have citizens on board, when you don't communicate to citizens about what is going on, um, you know, how do we build trust? between these different social worlds, right? Uh, the boundaries that you talked about, you know, that separate science and, you know, civil society, mm -hmm. uh, they're not separate and science should not and is not separate from, you know, the social world. So how do we sort of, you know, come together <laughs> in a way to resolve some of them? It's messy mm -hmm. uh, and some of these disputes aren't, aren't resolved, but from a government uh, perspective is really, you know, about public consultations. It's about, and what do those consultations mean? Is it about bringing indigenous communities on board? It's about bringing women's organizations, especially, you know, if it's, if their bodies are being implicated with a lot of these kinds of, uh, in the life sciences with this research area. So those are the kinds of things that I'm interested in, hmm. in pursuing. So yeah. policy, but also uh, power. Uh, power, but power. education as well. Yeah. It sounds like, uh, yeah. Yeah, because the, 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 more, the more we understand the processes, the more we can actually uh, uh, contribute in a meaningful manner and, mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, not, not less emotional uh, or, or less uh, absolutely results driven, uh, d depending on our perspective. Uh, d David, so you've been uh, engaged with uh, the, this educational uh, aspect through journalism. Um, I evoked uh, AI earlier. Um, and I think you would probably be especially interested in, in, in this, given that uh, it might replace uh, certain aspects of journalism. <laughs> but, but also you, you've been considering um, the, the impact of sciences on, on society. So would you like to tackle this, uh, this brand new topic, which uh, depending on who you listen to, uh, will, will, uh, AI will basically take over in uh, what, six months or 100 years, right? <laughs> Uh, this is a fun one, right? Because um, there, there's a lot of, of uh, thinking to do around AI and what it can and can't do and what it might involve. And there's a lot of players, there's a lot of political things, there's the science of it as well, which is extremely exciting and, and pushing boundaries um, in many ways, as well as it's a perfect example where um, there may or may not need to be policies, there may or may not need to be involvement um, in these ideas. But from my own perspective, how I'm often engaging with these is to think about the journalist, right? Mm -hmm. To think about like, how are they going to engage with this topic? What do they see their role as? And educationally as well, um, a little bit of what you alluded to is, is um, we've, we've wanted to also engage um, young scientists, students that are studying science in thinking about how they want to communicate what they believe and what they've learned and what they're doing um, in this kind of way. So to engage with the communication space around this particular one. In terms of, of AI itself, I think, you know, this, I was writing, when you asked the first question, what topics of science or things that might be interesting, like I started to kind of note down the things that went through my head and a whole bunch of different things about questions about past mentors who 
um, when I first got in my first ethics class that like formally at graduate school would ask me like, well, if you go into a hospital and someone takes a piece of you and grows a cell and turns it into a, an invention, who then owns that invention? So it was very legalistic <laughs> at that stage. Okay. Um, even though it was an ethics class, there was a lot of questions around like, do you own it? Do they consent? What um, was the answer? Um, well, <laughs> we're, uh, that's part of the fun. We'll get, I'll, get, I'll get Matt to come in in a second and he can give some good answers and then okay. Francesca can jump in. But I do have comments on that if we want to talk about it. But like, and then I went through health and uh, and then interest in food climate change the environment biodiversity all these things like our world right like right. that we're living in and now the the ad, advent advances around artificial intelligence combined with in my own interest um the synthetic kind of life kind of area in that sense mm -hmm. so i think we're at a time when this is this is the perfect example of we've been generating these processes in government in um, media who's becoming more and more self-reflective social media has also added a whole new thing where we might be in a space where we can actually kind of think more broadly about how you would collectively talk about an issue like this because mm -hmm. i think when i was first engaged in the health ones it was really it was doctors a few ethicists and maybe anybody else that was involved in government there was no right. public groups there mm -hmm. there was nobody from an indigenous group there at that stage like if that had happened it was only if some sort of like um controversy had happened around those kind of ideas so i'm not i know i'm not answering your question directly in, in that kind of a sense because i'm leaving it there. to see where everyone yeah. everyone goes but i think it, it, it in my own perspective it's it's one of these things where people are, are very excited and worried at the same time. Mm. And I often find that an interesting thing to study because there's journalists out there who are like, oh, chat, chat GPT, this, that, and the other. Um, I don't have to write the sports stories anymore. Like those can be written automatically and they've been doing that for five, 10 years anyways, like no humans involved in that kind of stuff. Um, and maybe that allows me more time to do other things or maybe I just don't have a job anymore um, because this can be done in another way. At the same time, there's this 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 question around um, experts in the field now stepping forward to say that we might have issues and we might need regulations around these kind of things. So for me, that's a really interesting space between the computer science, um, the public that may be interested and want to use these things, and government slash academia that is definitely deeply involved in discussing these every day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you think, Matt, about like, because I know AI is probably not the topic we all want to be like, hey, you know, I <laughs> know so much. It's great. Um, but it's also one of these things that like I find myself reading about daily, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. and not because I'm necessarily like doing a research project or trying to study it, but just because it's there always. And everyone I bump into wants to talk about it. Every student that's there wants to kind of ask questions. Well, can I use it for my assignments? Can I not? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. would I use it? So going into the summer, we're about to start the sixth version of this summer school around science journalism. And we're right now kind of very preliminary thinking about like how we should involve AI and, and either in discussions or around um, usage in the classroom in that kind of a sense. And then right. it becomes a fun thing to see also what the students do. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not an expert in AI, but all of us need to learn a bit about it real fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in incredibly exciting and concerning at the same time. From the point of view of somebody in philosophy, there, there's lots of ways in which it's interesting, exciting, worrisome. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the ways that I've had my own interest peaked is when I read some of the experts who are sounding alarm bells. Uh, it's curious that often it seems to be from a place of humility, mm. which is a little different than other cases in which alarm bells are sounded. Um, you, you've got experts saying, we don't know how this part of it even works. Like it, it, it does what we want it to do, but we're not sure how that happened, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you get explicit statements like this, right? right. In Time Magazine and stuff like that. So uh, to me, that's really interesting because in other cases, when thinking about conservation or other things like that, I've often been worried about a lack of humility and how do we um, get people to recognize their own epistemic limitations, you know, that, that they don't know maybe as much as they thought they know and mm -hmm. how's that gonna feed into our decision-making. But here with AI, I mean, it's, it's right out front right away. I mean, part of the problem is there's a lot we don't understand about it. Uh, and in some senses, it's one, it may be in one of those cases in which some of the decision problems involve us having a little better sense of the philosophy of the values than of the actual empirical issues, right? So we're not sure what the probability is that AI will go this way or go that, or that's gonna surpass you know, thresholds of consciousness mm -hmm. and stuff like that. 
but we're pretty sure we don't want this to happen, right? And we don't want that to happen. And, and so it's, uh, it's curious. It's, it's a different kind of issue, I think, than many that we've, we've grappled with lately. Um, and then for me, not having a background in AI, when an issue like this becomes salient really quickly, I think, well, how can I help? To, for me, it's often with students, right? It's mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. how, what can I do as a, an instructor? Because there's not much I can do as a researcher right now, right? right? Um, but as an instructor, yeah. um, getting people interested, not just in the science, but in the philosophical issues that come up. And I'm sure each of you would, are trying to get people interested in the humanities approach that you can take to this issue. Right? So. And you, you've both just evoked uh, the importance of engaging with students. And, and it, actually, uh, looking through your CVs, I noticed that all three of you uh, have developed classes that, uh, that do address issues of uh, 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 scientific issues um, within your departments. Matt, you developed a Philosophical Foundations of Biology course, which I'd, I'd love to hear about, uh, which actually started in biology and then I think it has been moving back and forth. Uh, Francesca, you looked at science, technology, and power uh, in poli sci, and, and, and Dave, you just mentioned uh, you're, you're about to start the sixth iteration of the summer seminar, this time in the projected futures. Um, what, uh, so I'll start with Francesca, so what, what, what was this course and, and how, how is this um, a useful environment basically to try to test some of these ideas and, and how, what do you get from the students in this context? Yeah. So I haven't taught that course in a long time, oh, okay. but it was one of my favorite uh, courses to teach. It was a mm -hmm. graduate level course. And again, it was an opportunity for me to bring in literature and scholarship from um, the uh, science and technology studies field, okay. right? And what we tried to do in that class is really think about, you know, regulatory science. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, how do governments use scientific advice? Um, what are the power relations that are involved in these kinds of discussions um, or disputes or policy making? So it could be, you know, at that time, it could also be like the, you know, the whole NIMBY uh, syndrome where you have, you know, reports that are saying, you know, your neighborhood is safe, you know, this, uh, this thing that we're, that we're building in your backyard is safe, you know, like you, the risk levels are low and then you have neighborhoods and, and activists within those neighborhoods saying, I don't feel safe, I'm gonna conduct my own research, I'm gonna go and, and hire my own experts, right, to, to make sure that, that, you know, indeed, you know, we can build this thing. Um, so those are the kinds of challenges at the local level, at the national level, at the international level as well, issues of, um, of claims making, of mm. epistemic authority, of, of uh, scientific experts. Uh, so those are the kinds of challenges, uh, power dynamics that that I was really interested in, and of course in the area of life sciences, right, where you had religious organizations, you had feminist organizations who emerged in the late 1980s and early 1990s internationally in Canada that were saying, wait a second, you know, we have these things going on. At the time, it was embryo research. Now we call mm. it stem cell research. We had surrogacy. We had genetic engineering, and all of these things are happening, and we don't have an eye on it. Uh, right. so, so those are the kinds of challenges, like how do we make policy as well when things are developing so quickly and we may not have the knowledge or know-how or the technology, especially on the side of government, to actually make those kinds of regulations. So then we have lesson drawing. We look to other countries. We want to see what's being done. We look at international epistemic communities uh, to come up with some advice and, and, um, and guidance on these kinds of issues. So, so those mm -hmm. are the kinds of things that, that we talk about from a policy perspective, like how do we do this? You know, what right. tools do we have uh, within government and outside to, to really um, make sure that we're, we're reaping the benefits of these technological developments while still, you know, trying to, to make sure that the, you know, the negative parts are, are controlled or regulated. Mm. And in that graduate seminar, so you had to, uh, uh, science and technology uh, students as well as poli sci students? They were mostly po like uh, okay. public policy. So, yeah. but a lot of our policy uh, students, um, you know, a lot of them come from political science or the social sciences, but we see some that are coming from, from you know, uh, other disciplines, right. right? And that may have an interest in politics or policy making okay. and, and want to work for agencies within government in health 
or science and technology or assessment boards. So that's the neat part, right? right. That you know yeah. that that these are sort of these are going to become very important places for our students, and I think it's important for them to have you know much more scientific background than I do, mm -hmm. um, so they can speak to that audience uh, in um, in an easier fashion, right? Yeah. Thank you. And I, I guess following uh, uh, following this logic, we so talk, talk to us, uh, Matt, about the uh, ph philosophical foundations of biology and this this meeting of the bio biology and uh, philosophy students. Yeah. So uh, it had an unusual beginning, I guess, because it started with a colleague who's now a really good friend in the biology department getting a hold of me one day and saying, you know, I think we need a philosophy course for our biology students. There's a lot of philosophy of science that they don't know about and mm. philosophical issues that come up and they're not sure how to engage it. Uh, so, you, you know, what do you think about designing a course like that? Uh, and so I started thinking about it. And one, one of the first things I was really happy about, I guess, was he was interested in parts of philosophy of science that a lot of people are often not aware of, right? So a lot of the time when you say you're a philosopher of science, they think, oh, so you do the ethics of science. But in fact, often philosophy of science is separate from the ethics. Mm -hmm. Instead, philosophy of science is looking at methods. How should, how should we think about evidence? What is evidence? What okay. kind of assumptions should we be making in our reasoning? Um, questions like that. The ethics come in too. But this was a scientist who already saw that and already saw that you're asking these kinds of questions and they're relevant to our students. Mm. Uh, so then the hard part was thinking about how to design this course so that both science students and people in the humanities, philosophy students especially, right, are going to enjoy it and get something out of it and convince both departments, right, because it, it is cross-listed. So it's, it's got a biology number and it's got a philosophy number. Uh, so that's where I had to do a lot of thinking and you know, read a lot of stuff. How, how should I integrate this? And my approach was always, and it still is with that course, to get the students to do a lot of work together. Uh, it goes back to this partnership and knowledge right. bit, right? Where they, you know, they're very sharp. They're, they come in usually with a lot of interest. Usually a science student doesn't choose a philosophy of science course unless they've got some kind of interest in that mm -hmm. side of science, right? Uh, so all the students come in granted with different backgrounds. Uh, different expertise, uh, but they all have some interest, and so then it's setting things up so they can teach and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. So they're coming in open-minded, but nonetheless with, I guess, disciplinary biases and expectations. What are some of the uh, points of uh, friction and, and perhaps convergence as well, uh, given their given their backgrounds? Yeah, they're they're actually uh, you know quite quick to recognize their own limits. And, and defer to each other. Okay. So I work hard to show them, I mean, often it's about arguments, right? So mm. what's the argument in this paper? What's the argument in that paper? And then showing them that these arguments have different parts that need to work together. Some of those parts are more scientific or empirical. Right. Some are more philosophical, but they, but they have to work together. And so pretty quickly they see the ways in which they can contribute, okay. right? So the scientists yeah. will say, oh yeah, that's an issue I know something about and I can, I can zero in on that part of the argument. And the philosophy students will be like, yeah, I have no idea about that, but I see this other <laughs> philosophical part, so let me okay. talk to you about that, right? Yeah, um, yeah so it, it's every time I've taught it, it's been a wonderful experience where the students uh, enjoy recognizing their limitations, but then trying to improve upon them and learn from each other. Yeah. That's great, thank you. And Dave, tell us about this projected futures uh, seminar. Um, so this is a, a fun one, and I, I kind of come at it in um, two different ways. Well, one is that the Faculty of Arts and Science um, was like the, like really the, the, the generator of this. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, um, and Patrick, you might remember, um, there were some ideas floating around about how could we do some, what could we do in the summer mm -hmm. that would engage with everything we have here, and it's not many students, but the things were interested in that sense. And could we bring students that weren't from Concordia, like the Concordia students could take it as well, but students from other places, potentially worldwide, to Concordia during the summer to learn about things. And at that point, I pitched an idea that had been going through my um, mind for quite some time. And I kind of take it in, in two points. Um, I, I don't know if this is going to lead us anywhere, but the first one was when I, when I was in the sciences, I was and I was a student. I was now later in time thinking about well, what might have helped me like mm. do better. 
to not be a like just walking into walls and making all sorts of mistakes and like saying bad jokes at the wrong time or <laughs> writing an article that was really bad and getting a lot of this is at the beginning of feedback from social media getting a lot of comments so what what could i have taken um that didn't exist then because there was virtually nothing at ubc at least mm. at that time now there's tons of stuff around science communication things like that right. but what would have helped me if i was interested in let's say just being a journalist very specifically if i wanted to be a science journalist what would have helped me so that was the one part of it what might that look like as a summer school and the second part was more um and this is where like i would be interested in the other panelists an interest in when I was looking around at science journalism, and this relates to the AI and the other things, um, there was just too many plausible futures for what the future of the profession might hold. Yeah. Like in the sense of I was hearing people saying, it's over, it's done, do not go into science journalism, like it's the worst job you could ever take, to, oh my God, it's so amazing, now's the time, everything's happening and people are willing to talk about it, to like everything in between, to new startups that are getting funded in terms of media and hiring everyone, to old businesses that have been around for 300 years disappearing um, and flooding journalists into the market, and a whole bunch of different other thinking around this idea that the possibilities were too many for any student to really know how to engage mm -hmm. with that field and how to change it positively. So that was where the projected futures came in, asking these students that were interested in potentially being science journalists, either really deeply or just, you know, that sounds interesting. I might take a class in that yeah. um, to think about what the future in their mind should look like. So what could a science journalist do to make the world better? Mm -hmm. And what would that look like? And if we're not there now, how would we get there? So we get students from around the world to come each summer. It's the sixth time. Um, basically science students mostly, but we're open to anybody. But that's often where we're targeting and thinking because that was part of the, yeah. the point one. Like yeah. what would I, as a PhD student, wanting to be a journalist, what could I have used? Mm -hmm. And spend you know a few weeks online together, some time here in person thinking through this and getting some our skills up enough that we could maybe make a plausible presentation of what that future might look like. Mm -hmm. So enough skill base that we could be like, all right, I'm not just gonna theoretically write that it might be this, but I'm gonna show you too. And then a few weeks afterwards. And you know, I've, I've loved this class for, for the energy, the different students, exactly what Matt um, and Francesca were talking about can bring to these ideas, right? So it's really kind of like a space where I could set it up and then just let it go. And they're, they're, let's see what they do. You know what I mean? Like how creative can we be? And then I really see my role as getting them to justify like, well, that sounds crazy. Then that will never happen. Tell me how it could. And kind of seeing the work to, to try to get as far as they can in that short period. Right. Thank you. So the, the, this idea of the projected future is obviously uh, can, can be interesting to all of us here. Uh, what, what are the projected futures um, with regards to, to humanities, social sciences, uh, looking, looking onto the sciences, but also uh, feeding from uh, current scientific uh, uh, exploration and, and innovations, um, what, what, what's in, what's in uh, what's in store for us? Where are we going with Matt? You're ready for that one, right? <laughs> where are we going with life? Sure. Uh, so, where is this interaction between the sciences, yeah. humanities, and social sciences going? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, or so, could go. yeah. I mean, I think we could use better integration of these things, mm -hmm. right? So. As research has progressed in every field, it's gotten more specialized and silos tend to come up. Uh, and so that increasingly puts in front of us the job to connect these things and better coordinate and better integrate. And when we're faced with really pressing issues, we tend to see that and do it pretty quickly, like with, with AI. Um, but we have to do it, I think, on a, on a broader level. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a challenge for academia, I think, and research and inquiry in general. Uh, but yeah, I think it's about coordination and cinching up that partnership. Thank you. Francesca? No, I completely agree. I do think that there's, there's a greater demand or emphasis on having these collaborations, even from uh, granting um, agencies, grant agencies, tri-council agencies, right, that they want to see those kinds of coll collaborations or bridging between silos, so so definitely, I, I see a future. I mm -hmm. see that there's going to be more collaboration. It's going to come with challenges, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think so, we we still speak different languages, um, um, you know, still different agendas or ways of looking. But I think that's sort of the um, the fun stuff, right? It's sort of you know coming up with that common language to address you know common uh, areas of interest. Mm -hmm. 
Dave? I don't know how to answer exactly in the sense of, I'm not sure like where like things will go. I can see some threads and ideas and collaboration for sure, bringing these things together. Um, one of the places my mind goes to, which may not answer the question is cheesy in the sense of the students that I'm engaging with to me seem to be like what the world needs, like the leadership, the thinking, the ideas, the openness to all sorts of different fields. They're not feeling like they need to be tied down to like, oh, I'm, someone labeled me a scientist. No, I'm way more than that. I'm eight different things hmm. all at once. And I'm gonna try to integrate those. So it's exactly the same comments as Matt and Francesca were saying, but I see a very interesting kind of space where um, we can have more open and dynamic, practical kind of, um, discussions around this like we want to move towards AI being in this like able to do this and not able to do that and instead of this well no I know oh, no better from x expert or y kind of group people kind of thinking like okay well let's get together and see what might kind of happen there in that kind of sense so this idea that there's um, a, a desire for thinking about the future that seems a lot more intense to me these mm -hmm. days mm -hmm. combined with this humility that i think matt put really well that like just hit me like a chord like bang mm -hmm. that's true right. and i've seen it in the synthetic biologists at concordia who yeah. i think are amazing yeah. i used to have to pull teeth to talk to people about things related to just journalism and how communication could be better and you think everybody wants to talk about that everyone can hate on something <laughs> about how x was done or y was done but it was like not as easy as you think people would be a little fearful they're saying well i don't want to say things especially if it's going to be recorded so right. i might read this later yep. to a point where when i started to engage with the field of synthetic biology as just an example they were right there on day one saying we need this we want this we know what impact synthetic life might have mm -hmm. on the world and where we're going and i don't want to go there without an open discussion around this in that sense and it was really refreshing and i've seen students respond to that openness really well Thank you so much. I think that's an excellent concluding uh, comment. Um, do, do we have time for questions uh, from the audience? Yeah. Uh, e either online or in our live audience. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I see something on the chat, but I can't read it. We're good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. So there, there, are, there are no questions. Thank you so much uh, to each and every one of you. It was, it was a pleasure. Um, this concludes our uh, 18th conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, <laughs> we did it. <laughs> um, I, I really would like to, to reiterate uh, my thanks to the Force Space and, and everyone who's been uh, involved from the very start. Uh, they're uh, an extraordinarily professional, um, reassuring team. It's always been a pleasure to come here and we feel very uh, welcome. So thank you. Um, again, thanks to the, to the Dean of Arts and Science, uh, Pascal Sicot, who has supported this from day one and uh, to Rebecca Ackman, who has uh, basically run the show from the, from the wings. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she prepares me, she prompts you, she asks you to send the information. She helps me summarize, synthesize. Thank you so much. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without you. Um, hopefully we can uh, continue with some version, some form of this uh, next year. But for now, let's take a bit of a, <laughs> of a break over the summer and uh, we'll see you, uh, see you next year. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.